de la Universidad de San Andrés, en Escocia. Es además miembro del Centro para la Investigación y el Moderado Ecológico y Ambiental, también de la Universidad de San Andrés. Anne es una de las principales referentes a nivel mundial en estudios de biodiversidad. Sus libros son lectura obligada de todos aquellos que incurren en la medición de la biodiversidad. Su más reciente contribución, como ella ya mostró, es eh, el libro de Universidad Biológica, Fronteras en Medición y Evaluación, del cual ella es coeditora y coautora junto a un montón de especialistas, un, un libro. Y entre otras cosas, el currículum es muy grande, pero ha sido premiada por la Royal Society con la distinción Wolfson Research Merit. Y recientemente la Universidad de Bergen le ha otorgado el título Doctor Honoris Causa. Junto a su grupo de investigación, entre otras líneas, aborda actualmente el estudio de los cambios en la que la biodiversidad enfrenta a nivel global, entre los que se destacan los procesos de homogenización biológica. Eh, quiero destacar que Anne accedió inmediatamente a nuestra invitación para asistir a Argentina, eh, lo cual nos produjo muchísima satisfacción inmediatamente. Y también quiero resaltar que si bien nosotros le habíamos ofrecido cubrir todos sus, sus gastos de viaje, eh, ella consiguió fondos eh, sin que nosotros se los pidamos para los pasajes de, desde el Reino Unido hasta acá de Argentina y de vuelta. Entonces, eso para mí también tiene un, un gran valor. Eh, así que se lo quería reconocer. Y bueno, los, los dejo con Ana. Ana, please. We know that the world's population has risen very steeply in the past few years. In 1413, which is the year that my university was founded, there were 400 million people on the face of the earth. Last year, there were over 7.5 million. The world's population is more than double in the time that I've been working in biodiversity. And you can see here the very steep rise in the recent past. Different parts of the world are experiencing different pressures. In Europe, the um, population increase has more or less flattened off. In other parts of the world, particularly Africa, the population is still rising very steeply. This increasing number of people is clearly putting a lot of pressure on the world's resources. And we know all too well the impacts we're having terms of pollution and so on. One of the most obvious effects is on biodiversity and you will be very well aware that there's much paper, many commentaries devoted to the current biodiversity crisis and this is just one of a sample of headlines about the topic. Sorry. I'm not, not lying, sorry. Oh, uh, okay. That's, oh, I, 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 I can not it. Okay. <laughs> can, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so, so this is one of the one of the typical headlines that, that we see today. It's very much focused on biodiversity loss, but I would like to make the point during this talk that. The situation is, is more complex and if we as biodiversity scientists want to understand how the world is changing, we need to understand the 
patterns and the complexities and the processes that under, underlie changes in biodiversity that we're seeing around us. Now, there's been a lot of um, attention given to something called the Living Planet Index. And every time it comes out, the headlines, certainly at home, are highlighting a very dire picture for biodiversity. The Living Planet Index is an index which focuses on populations. It takes populations which have been monitored over a number of, of years, and it looks at the trends in those populations, and then it puts them together in an index, which is essentially the geometric lead of those population trends. So the headline figures from this is always doom and gloom. So they're saying that there have been massive declines in the Living Planet Index since 1970. And one of the headline figures that comes out of this is that the populations of vertebrate species have dropped by half. Those would be the vertebrate species which are, are surveyed as part of this Living Planet Index. And that's the sort of picture that we see. You can see that, 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 that there's a fairly steep decline. But this is the whole story. Okay, so um, while on the one hand a, a, a lot of attention is, is paid to decreases in, in population sizes and biodiversity, there are well documented instances of cases where population sizes are rising. And this is one example from Europe where um, populations of iconic large vertebrates have been tracked over the past 50 years. And these are the patterns that we see. For all of the species that, we've, that have been uh, quantified, the populations have actually risen since the change in abundance through time. This is the red deer, uh, which is uh, found in Scotland. In fact, red deer populations are so high now that they're considered to be a problem. So there are certainly instances where populations are coming back. So it's certainly not the case that everything is declining. This is the Living Planet Index broken down into different biogeographic realms. And again, you can see that the picture is, is, is nuanced. In the near Arctic, it's more or less flat. Uh, um, in Europe and, and our part of the world, it's, it's more or less flat. There's a very steep decline in the neotropics, and this, in fact, is the most dramatic decline. But if you look at the numbers of taxa that go into producing this index, we see that they're actually rather small. So I was talking earlier about the number of, of, of fish species in, in, in the Amazon, and the number of fish that go into the Living Planet Index in the tropics is tiny compared to the total number of species we see there. And one thing about the Living Planet Index, as it is um, calculated today, is that it is weighted by the diversity of the system. So the index in the tropics will be weighted by the total number of fish in the neotropics. So if for any reason those are not a, a random subset, then we're going to get a different picture from reality. <coughs> now it's clear that humans as species have been interested in biodiversity from our earliest time. And I'm just taking you back here to an early cave painting which highlights some of the aspects of biodiversity that we're interested in. Um, you can see here the different species are identified the cave painters were aware that there were different abundances of species. So this appreciation of biodiversity is rooted in, in our past as a species. It's only relatively recently, however, that we have started to quantify biodiversity. And if you heard the last session, <coughs> you won't be surprised if I mention Darwin again. As far as I can tell, Darwin was the first person to systematically quantify biodiversity. And to do this, he went to the house that he lived in southern England, down. This is a meadow beside it, a place called Great Pucklands. And in 1855, he went to this meadow and simply identified and counted all the species that were in the meadow. So that's his very first, as far as I can tell, the very first enumeration of biodiversity. Now, we tend to think of species and communities as 
entities that are rather like pictures in a museum. We go back to the same place, we would expect to see the same species over and over again. And some conservation policy is directed towards preserving these assemblages more or less intact. However, that's not entirely a correct picture of reality. And this is a lovely quote from Darwin, and I, I'm just uh, reading it out to you, because Darwin, as part of his, or as a consequence of, of his researches, knew about this very important point. In fact, in this particular quote, he encapsulates a number of different important um, ideas in ecology. He says, we forget that each species, even where it most abounds, is constantly suffering enormous destruction at some period of its life from enemies or from competitors for the same place in food. And if these enemies or competitors in, um, are in the least degree favoured by any slight change in climate, they will increase in numbers. And as each area is already fully stocked with inhabitants, other species must increase. <coughs> so Darwin here is putting his finger on a key idea of ecology. That is, that resources are limited, species will gain and lose advantage over time as a consequence of various factors, and that the composition of these assemblages will change through time. They're not in fact static. There's a dynamicism in uh, natural assemblages. So we can think of biodiversity changing through time in a number of different ways. So here are three possible scenarios. Time one, time two. We can see change either in the sense that um, Species richness and composition change here, or abundance changes, but richness and composition are the same, or that composition changes, but richness and abundance are the same. So there's more than one way that ecological diversity can change through time. Now, I mentioned this earlier as well. Uh, we had a big project to try and quantify biodiversity change across the world and it involved constructing our biotime database, which I also mentioned earlier. And the data were distributed across the planet in this way. We had over 100 time series and over 6 million individual records. <coughs> and what we did was to take each assemblage, which had been quantified through time, time as an assemblage time series, and to see how the diversity of that assemblage had changed over the time period of the study. So first of all, we focused on alpha diversity. Alpha diversity, as you know, is the quantification of how much diversity there is in the system. It can be measured by metrics such as species richness or the Shannon index, for example. And here we use species richness. So each of these lines refers to an assemblage and how it has changed over time. So you can see that some go down, some go up, some stay much the same. This is the common trend, uh, models fitted to all the data, and it's remarkably flat. So if we take all of these data together and look at the change in species richness, we see no systematic effect, no systematic change. However, if we look at compositional change, the picture becomes very interesting. So here we're looking at the Jacquard measure of similarity and we're seeing how much the similarity of the communities changes through time. Now Darwin tells us, of course, in the quote I showed you, that communities do change through time. So we, we'd expect some degree of increasing dissimilarity through time. Um, but that's entirely to be expected. And of course we see that most of these lines go down. And indeed the common trend goes down here. But to see if that <coughs> decrease in compositional um, composition was more than we would expect. We ran two different null models, and uh, one of those was the um, neutral model, another was based on basic um, equilibrium theory. Um, and in both cases, the amount of decline in diversity that we saw, the composition that we saw, was more than we would expect by chance. So to summarize those results, in terms of alpha diversity, there's neither a systematic loss nor a systematic gain in the number of species recorded through time. Um, 59 of them show, 59 of these communities show an increase, and 41 show a decrease. <coughs> when we look at beta diversity, temporal turnover, 
Seven and nine of the hundred communities showed substantial changes in composition measured relative to the baseline of the study. And these changes were greater than we would predict using two different null models, using the best ecological theory we have to play with at the moment. Now we've been following that up recently uh, by looking at <coughs> the extent to which communities are regulated, that is the extent to which they retain their properties through time. And um, just to quickly summarise that study, we took 59 of the previous studies. These were ones which had a particularly nice long time series and that we, we could uh, model accurately. And we found that these provided evidence for um, the regulation of uh, the community um, structure through time, both in terms of the numbers of species and the abundance of those species. If you're interested, it was in test by the subject of the Dickie test. And um, papers online for anybody who cares to read it. And just to explain in a little bit more detail what, it, what that means, um, <coughs> what it means is if if the communities adhere to the dynamics that we've tested using this model, they show um, a definite tendency to return to their previous state following perturbation, as illustrated here. So a, regu a regulated community looks like this normally. If it's perturbed, it, it declines, and here's restrictions, and then recovers. But if we have a, a, a community which um, is showing a pattern of a random walk, it looks roughly similar in the absence of perturbation. But following the perturbation, uh, the species direction stays low. So that's quite nice evidence, I think, that the size and structure of the communities are regulated through time. And it fits with, uh, with our observation of the systematic change in species directions. However, the other side of this observation is that temporal turnover is playing a very important role in this story. So these are our, um, roughly the locations of, of the studies. Um, they hide our glass being jittered a little bit so they can fit on. In this case, we've looked at the, the overall um, temporal turnover, and in this case, we have partitioned it into the component of turnover, which is due to so called nestedness, that's the change in the amount of richness, and the, the um, component of the turnover, which is due to pure turnover. And the turnover component is blue. And just glancing at this, you can see that in many cases, Turnover, pure turnover, is, is playing a major role in um, the dynamics of these communities, which suggests to us that compositional change does have a role to play in community regulation. So then I think we can think about biodiversity change as falling into two different parts. There's temporal alpha diversity, that's change in the amount of diversity we see in the system, and temporal beta diversity, that's change in the compositional structure of the assemblage. And we need to take account of both of those if we are to understand how communities are changing through time. Now, to dig down into the processes that might underlie these community um, stability or this community regulation, I'm going to take you to another study system. This is based at uh, in Bristol Channel, in this part of southern England. And in this case, the sampling device is rather unusual. It's a nuclear power station. <laughs> nuclear power stations require a lot of water. Uh, so they, they're taking water in from the Bristol Channel. However, they don't particularly want fish to get in, into their system. So there are screens that pre prevent the fish from getting into a nuclear power station. My colleague, Peter Henderson, who's here, has for 36 years now been going to Inkley Point every month and um, quantifying the fish that have been trapped on the screens of this nuclear power station. The sampling takes place at the same phase of the tidal cycle, so it's equivalent in, in terms of the amount of water involved. Um, there are over 80 species in, in the study now, and well over 100 thousand individuals and for some of the, um, the time series we have biomass measured as individual weights of, of, of fish caught. So it's a really nice data set to work with and um, 
I want to pay particular credit to, to Pete here for keeping it going for all of this time. These are examples of, of some of the fish that are um, collected in the system. And um, just to give you an overview, uh, this is what the community looks like. So these are the, the species, I've called the poorest species, the ones that are, that are present most of the time. If we plot their numerical abundance through time, it seems a bit of a mess, doesn't it? Lots of stuff going on there. However, if we look at the overall size of the community, and here I've, I've plotted biomass, it's remarkably stable through time. So can, can we look into the community and try and understand what is going on? So our first observation was that these species in the community differ quite dramatically in terms of their presence in the system. We have some species at this end of the graph, which are very infrequent. They occur just one or two years, and they're never seen again. And we have another group of species at this end of this plot, which are there almost all the time, and not, not so much in the middle. We find that the species that are there all the time also are the abundant taxa. So if a species is always present, it tends to be always abundant, and the species is there only occasionally, it tends to be rare even when it is there. And we can use this information to look at the species abundance distribution, such as this one, where we've got the frequency of species against their abundance, the log 10 class. And we can see the persistent species, these guys, uh, formalizable normal distribution, whereas the infrequent ones, the occasional ones, are much more clustered at, at the rare end of this graph. So that allows us to deconstruct the species of distribution in terms of the, of the temporal behaviour of the species. So that's the first partition. Partition is looking at the functional ecology of the species. So species in this system um, are found in, in, in different spatial habitats in Bristol Channel. We have some pelagic species, we have some which reside close to the bottom, and we have some bottom dwelling species. We have some that, that live in soft habitats, some that live in, in rocky habitats, and a few that live in weedy habitats. So the fish belong to different spatial habitats. One of the things that we found was that um, <coughs> density dependence varied depending on the um, temporal behaviour of the species. We find that, that of the um, persistent species, um, 23 of them, was over, uh, 23 of, of the persistent species um, had um, dynamics that were um, linked or that could be explained uh, as being under density dependence. And these 23 persistent species explained over 98% of the overall biomass. We find four persistent species whose dynamics could not be seen to be under density dependence. And, and these included things such as the Lasmobrites, who are in trouble anyway. And then for the um, transient species, uh, that their dynamics were essentially random, they were not under density dependence. <coughs> um, looking at the uh, pattern of the uh, plot of the abundances of the species through time, the ones under density dependence are the blue ones. Uh, the persistent species who do not have density dependence are the red ones, and the other ones are the grey ones. And you can see how the, um, the extent to which the species are, are um, density dependent or not uh, influences their position on the species bundle distribution. And this is also just a little graph um, looking at the variation in abundances through time, coefficient of variation. Uh, against biomass, the ones that are under density dependence are, are with abundant and not very variable. The ones that are not under density dependence tend to be much more variable in their abundances through time. So this density dependent behaviour is contributing, uh, one of the factors that contributes to the regulation of the system, to the maintenance of assemblage properties through time. So the second aspect that contributes to um, 
community regulation is this idea that if abundances are asynchronous, then they will average out to produce stability in community properties. And this is just a, a little graph to illustrate that. If we have just one species, then the whole community reflects the, the dynamics of, of that species. If we have many species and the abundances are offset, we have much more evenness or uh, consistency in the property of interest. <coughs> so we find that um, the uh, assemblage can be divided up into uh, groups of fish that, that live in um, live at different or abound at different times of the year. So, so for this particular cluster analysis, it's a cluster analysis of the temporal dynamics, the seasonal seasonal dynamics of, of the species in the system. And we just allowed the analysis to pick out different groups of fish. And interestingly, it picked out groups which are uh, in seasons that, that relate to our own understanding of seasons, winter, spring, autumn, and summer. And um, the fact that the species are abundant at different times of the year, in, uh, different groups of species are abundant at different times of the year, is one of the reasons how they can divide up the resources in the habitat. The second way that they can divide up the resources is in terms of their annual abundances. Now, if we look at the correlations in the abundances of the whole assemblage, we find evidence for positive covariance in abundance. That means that if you look at the community overall, things tend to go up at the same time and down at the same time, if we take their overall annual abundances. And that's illustrated in this particular plot by the fact you can see many more blue dots than red ones. Blue dots are, are pairs of species whose abundances are positively correlated, highly significantly positively correlated, and the red dots are ones where abundance of species are highly significantly anti-correlated. Many more red ones, many more blue ones, sorry, than red ones. That's what happens if we look at the whole assemblage, all of these persistent species together. But if we divide it into those gills that I mentioned before, we find that within each of these individual gills, the um, annual abundances of the species involved are statistically asynchronous. We can test them using various models to quantify the stability and synchronicity of the assemblage, and we can show quite nicely that the individual <coughs> species within the gills partition up the assemblage um, in, in terms of, of their annual abundances. So that reduces competition. Okay, to sum this up, um, communities can be partitioned into functional groups. Density dependence under underpins temporal stability of the abundant species and helps maintain the community properties. Um, and asynchronous abundance patterns, both seasonal and annual, contribute to stability. And I could talk a lot more about this system, but I want to go on and, and tell you about a few other things. I'm going to take you now to Trinidad, which is just off the coast of Venezuela. And um, it, it's, it's a very beautiful place to work, and I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to have been working there for a number of years. So we had a project looking at the biodiversity of freshwater ecosystems in Trinidad's northern range. So this study took 16 different localities in the northern range, and we focused on three assemblages. We focused on, on fish, and the benthic invertebrates and the diatoms, and we also measured environmental variables. So we sampled each of these um, stream systems four times each year for five years. We have 20 data points on 16 sites for three assemblages. Um, this is uh, Amy Deacon, who is postdoc working in the project. Amy is now a lecturer at the University of the West Indies. This is an example of one of the streams. And uh, this is um, to organize the project um, doing some fishing for one of our streams. Okay, so this is a summary of the results. So here uh, we've got change in alpha diversity over time and change in beta diversity over time. And we've got the fish, invertebrates, and diatoms in each case. 
Now, we quantified change by looking at the um, trends of, 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 the, of the metrics we were interested in relative to a null model. So if we see a pattern, we know that it's more than we expect by chance. So if, if you can uh, just look at a few of these, we find rather a few examples of change in alpha diversity in this site here. We find a decrease in alpha diversity. Red ones go down here, and blue ones go up. And we find one site where there was an increase in invertebrate diversity. So there's rather little signature of change in alpha diversity in the system. <coughs> but you can see that there are quite a few cases of changes in um, beta diversity. But these are, are spread rather haphazardly across the, the different assemblages. So again, we get the signal of much more change in composition than community size. But we also have the observation that the different components of the ecosystem, the different assemblages of the ecosystem, are doing different things. So far, most of these studies have been relatively focused on, on fairly small areas. A further factor to take into consideration is the fact that biodiversity, biodiversity change is very scale dependent. So this is a little um, paper that we put together a few years ago, led by Brian McGill, in which we tried to assemble the information on biodiversity change in relation to the scale of different systems. So this is change in temporal uh, beta diversity, alpha diversity, and this looks at spatial diversity and um, assemblage size. So alpha diversity is fairly, fairly well um, Categorized, we know that alpha diversity is declining at the global level. Um, <coughs> it's apparently flat in many cases at, at the local level, and it's an indication of rises in intermediate levels. But in terms of temporal beta diversity, we're much more in the dark. Um, we, we think it's increasing at, at local levels. And we think it's increasing at, at global levels, but we're very uncertain about the changes at metapopulation and our geographic scales. Some of the factors that might be involved in causing changes in composition at, at these intermediate scales are, are factors such as habitat trans transformation, invasive species, climate change, and harvesting. A biotic homogenization, which is a uh, factor of process which encapsulates some of these um, effects is a major uh, determinant of current um, patterns of virus today. This is just one example of house sparrow um, which is native to this part of the world that we see at home but it's spread to many other parts including here and I've seen house sparrows outside. In terms of fish um, there's a lot of evidence of, of uh, about uh, homogenization of fish faunas. Uh, this is North America, which has a lot of endemic species, particularly in this part of the country. But um, there was one study done some years ago which showed that there's much more sharing of species amongst the states than there would have been at the time of the European settlement. So this looks at the change in the numbers of shared species amongst pairwise combinations of states. If there had been no change, the graph would be centred here. In fact, we find that states on average share 15, or more than 15 species than they would have done at the time of the European colonisation. <coughs> most of them are concentrated, most of these introductions are concentrated in the west of the United States, and these are some of the species involved. So, for example, um, carp, which is native to Asia, is now in 48 states, goldfish in 42, brown trout in 39, and so it goes. And I'm sure there are very similar phenomena here. Now, we think of biotic homogenization as being something that's much more likely to affect terrestrial systems and freshwater systems than marine ones. And uh, this is a quote um, from Bob Megan. Um, he says, talk about diversity generally, and the effects on diversity in the sea may be compounded by the lack of barriers compared to terrestrial environments to long distance dispersal. 
which may allow distant migrants, migrants to contribute to resulting patterns of local diversity. So here he's suggesting that there's much less patterning in marine systems relative to terrestrial ones. We would expect much lower levels of spatial biodiversity, for example. But is this the case? Can we also detect biotic homogenization in the sea? We had a look at uh, for this in a study focused on marine fish to the west of Scotland. These are data which are collected by ICES, um, which compiles a lot of information, particularly from European systems. Um, and in this particular case, this is done by a, a systematic survey um, carried out, uh, in this case by the Scottish government, um, at, at particular times of the year. And again, it's a nice data set. It's uh, also about 30 years. The fishing is done in terms of these things called ICES rectangles. And for this study, we focused on latitudinal bands. So that gave us um, nine altogether um, off the west coast of Scotland. And because the sampling effort varies somewhat from year to year, we use sample-based rarefaction to allow us to make fair comparisons amongst the data. This is an example of the coastline of the west of, coast, of the west of Scotland, just to give you an idea of what it looks like. So the um, first result was that, as before, the community size is not going down, um, or at least not typically going down. In these graphs, <coughs> the left one is, is um, species richness, rarefied species richness, these are the trends through time, with a, um, a, a trend line fitted to them. There are two cases in which there's a significant decline, but in most cases the relationship is showing no significant trend. This one looks at the uh, number of individuals caught, again after verification, and in two, six cases there's actually an increase in the abundance of the uh, communities. I should say this is offset by, to a slight extent, by a decrease in the sizes of the fish. So the biomass is more or less constant. This is um, just a plot of the uh, catches <coughs> in the waters of the United Kingdom. And um, you can see that, that uh, there was a vast increase in catches there, which has sort of come down <coughs> since 2000. So, the impact of, of fisheries on these systems is there, and we have to take that into account in trying to understand the patterns that we see. This is the, the same plot, but here I've just pulled out the waters to the west of Scotland where we did the biotic, biotic homogenization study. And I, I do not know at this stage um, what, if any, um, the effect of these catches have had on shifting the composition of the community. But I do know that there have been many, many changes over time on the communities of fish that we see around Britain. So this is St Andrews, where I live and work, in this part of Scotland. And this is the Firth of Forth, which is uh, a major inlet. This lady is called Mary Somerville. Um, Mary Somerville was, was um, an outstanding person. She was born in Burnt Island in the 1700s. She was self-educated and she went on to be one of the premier scientists of her day. And those of you who know Oxford will know there's a college called Somerville College, or the Somerville College which was named in the honor. So she writes about growing up in Burnt Island and, and she says, looking out to the Firth and Forth, and all the shoals of herrings that have come up the Firth. The very sea was rippled by them. Whales were seen spouting in various directions. Well, I could, I could tell you, you do not see whales spouting in various directions today. And the herring industry, that was once so important in the area, has collapsed. The whole of this part of Fife, where I live, was basically underpinned by the herring industry. And as, as you well know, it's one of the fisheries that collapsed. So I think that's more or less all I want to say. I'll just finish up um, by summarizing a few points. Um, we know that biodiversity is under unprecedented threat. And I think 
none of us is going to forget that. As I said earlier, our challenge is trying to get some of the policy makers to, to understand that, that very basic point. Um, however, when we start to look at it, we find that the picture is quite interesting, quite nuanced. Um, a same ridge temporal alpha diversity is not showing systematic change. <coughs> I should stress these are assemblages from sites which are not being dramatically transformed. They're areas which are continued more or less as they are. If, if you go to a, to a city, well, there are clearly fewer species than there were there before the city was built. But for assemblages which, which have been intended as, as they are, assemblage temporal diversity, alpha diversity is not showing systematic change. And we do see evidence that communities are regulated, the size of the community is regulated through time. However, as I've shown, um, temporal beta diversity, composition turnover, is changing in excess of predictions informed by the best ecological models that we have. Uh, we also know these patterns are scale dependent. And I'd like to finish uh, by what I think is a very interesting challenge for the future. And um, I didn't mention this Philanzanti question earlier about what the big questions are, but I think this is a big question. We need to understand when temporal turnover supports community integrity and regulation, and when there's so much turnover that communities are destabilized. And I think this is a key challenge for the future. Thank you.